Welcome. Today is a very special day. It's Diwali Day. And for all that celebrate Diwali that are here, and we have more than 400 people online, happy Diwali Day. We're also honored to have two incredible economists with us today. Lauren Summers probably needs no introduction. I'll introduce him in a few minutes. And uh, Professor Mishkin, who may not need introduction as well, but some may not be as familiar with Professor Summers. So in a few minutes, I'll introduce Professor Mishkin as well. But I want to just go through a few housekeeping and other announcements and thank yous first. So today we have over 100 people that are here uh, present in MIT being a scientific institute. I think we ought to congratulate two organizations, not MIT, you know, for making this possible. And they are Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna. For <laughs> For this event would have been impossible a year ago. I'd also like to thank Professor Glenn Ellison, the chair of the MIT Economics Department. I don't think he goes by chair, but department head. And uh, he was instrumental in helping us bring Professor Mishkin, uh, or at least introduce me to Professor Mishkin, to invite him. And he was generous enough to come. By the way, both Prof. Summers and Mishkin are MIT alum. Uh, yes, and uh, Professor Mishkin is a PhD from MIT. Uh, Professor Summers got his upriver. Uh, there are just quickly a few other people I want to thank. Uh, in uh, the Department of Economics, MIT, a Megan Miller. Uh, has brought over 150 students online to attend this event. It's unusual that alumni and students collaborate, but uh, she enabled this to happen, and we're so glad to have you if you can hear us. Uh, the MIT alumni staff of both Sloan and MIT itself helped to make this happen as well. But a few people right in this room really did help to make this happen. And if you would just Stand up or acknowledge yourself when I mention your name. Gregor Hanishak uh, is the uh, social chair of the MIT Sloan Club of New York, and he did all the interaction between this club and the Cornell Club, and we're so glad to be here. So, uh, Gregor, thank you very much. Anusha Kalantari is our marketing chair, and She's responsible for all the communications and has done a wonderful, wonderful job. And for any Sloanies who have not been to our website yet, please go there. She's done an amazing thing in really taking our uh, website to the next level. So Anusha, where are you? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Peter Dolch, is he still here? Um, he's our finance chair, and he really knows all his way around accounting. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. He's the best. Uh, and then we have, uh, I'm, for time, not going to mention other people's names, but we have uh, four other alumni who just helped in the registration in, in little things that make something like this work. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, at MIT, Colette Thompson, who's not here, is our administrative assistant who really does make the pieces fit together. So Colette, thank you. Uh, now, one very important person who's not MIT, I wish she were, but uh, she's Cornell, and the reason why we're here, uh, Linnell Jones, uh, she's our sponsor. And she will be our sponsor again with the MIT Club uh, for our holiday party in December. So Linnell, thank you so, so much. Uh, a shout out to Danielle Solera, who is the uh, food and beverage uh, amazing genius at the Cornell Club that helped out as well. But uh, the most important thank you is to all of you and all of you online. So uh, I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, I've 
semi-introduced Professors Mishkin and Summers, but I'm going to do it uh, again, not at a length, but uh, uh, Professor Mishkin is the Alfred Lerner Professor of Banking and Financial Institutions at the Graduate School of Business, Columbia University. And uh, uh, he is also the former uh, member governor of the uh, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. He's been a senior fellow at FDIC, and he's a PhD from MIT. So thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Professor Mishkin <laughs> is going to be our moderator. And uh, Professor Summers, uh, President Emeritus of Harvard, uh, he's served as uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, uh, in uh, 2009 to 2011. He's been on the uh, National Economic Council uh, of advisors for the uh, Obama administration. He's been associated with the World Bank uh, as chief economist, and he's the current Charles W. Eliot University professor at Harvard University. And I don't know if in this room you know who Charles W. Eliot is, but he's the former president of Harvard maybe 100-something years ago. And I don't know if Professor Summers wants me to mention this, but he had a role in trying to acquire MIT for Harvard. <laughs> uh, but we forgive him for that, and we forgive Lawrence Summers for taking on that particular professorship. Uh, there's going to be one slight change. Uh, uh, we're going to go dive right into the, uh, to, into the uh, fireside chat. So if uh, Professor Summers and Michigan, if you'd step forward and take it away. Thank you very much. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with, out the fireside, but uh, the fireside chat. Uh, Larry and I have known each other a long time. Uh, I first met Larry when I was an assistant, I think first year assistant professor at the University of Chicago, and Larry was a year behind me. And he uh, came out for a job talk, and uh, uh, we had a three-fit blizzard, and we actually had Larry in an overcoat. Uh, I, was poking, I was on cross-country skis poking him to try to get to uh, the dinner parties because we could not drive anywhere. So that was when we first met. We've known each other a long time. This will not be a hostile uh, interview. Larry and I have been very much on the same page. Uh, that, uh, so we'll discuss a lot of these issues in terms of policy. I asked Larry uh, uh, when he first talked talking about the fact that, uh, that, uh, uh, that inflation was going to be a problem and that there were probably the Federal Reserve was making mistakes. And he told me he wrote this column in February. I started talking about it at CNBC in April, so we've been very much on the same wavelength. So the first thing I'd like to ask Larry is, uh, uh, how'd you figure it out? You know, I've been uh, speaking about the economy for now the better part of uh, 40 years, and I've got all kinds of opinions at all kinds of times about policy. But and in a lot of other things as well, by the way. Well. <laughs> but most of the time, my view about what's going to happen in the economy isn't wildly different from the consensus because I don't see a basis for wildly disagreeing with the consensus. But as I thought about the situation in the winter of 2021, I used the secret sauce of economics, which is arithmetic. And I realized that the economy was on the order of 2 or 3% short of its potential, and that we were proposing to infuse 15% of GDP in fiscal stimulus, and that on top of that, monetary policy had the accelerator to the floor, and that on top of that, there was a couple trillion dollars, 10% of GDP, that people had not been able to spend because they couldn't go to restaurants or take vacations the year before, some of which they'd spent. I didn't know what the multiplier was exactly. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen on the supply side. But I compared 14 plus a lot with three, and I concluded that this bathtub was going to overflow. 
and that the form that that would take would be substantial inflation. I don't think I thought about it terribly hard at the time, but I thought if you're doing this, the inflation's not going to be the same everywhere. There are going to be some places where there are bigger bottlenecks, some places where there are going to be smaller bottlenecks. So there are going to be some important changes in uh, relative uh, prices, but that you're going to see a shortage of labor. You're going to see a shortage of a variety of things. You're going to see things that are in short supply, so the people who produce them are going to have a ton of pricing power, so there's going to be a lot of profit. And that's what I thought would happen. And you're going to see that people are going to get quite upset about all the spending that took place. And they're going to go, you guys had your big shot. You don't get another big shot. And so the administration's idea that the Rescue Act was just the first thing and that then they were going to do trillions of dollars more in public investment wasn't going to happen uh, politically. So I did what kind of a prudent person does, which is I said that <coughs> we're running a substantial risk of the worst inflation in uh, more than a uh, generation. And the mystery to me was I didn't think anything I just said was very difficult. And so I didn't really understand why the prevailing view among the economists in the administration, the economists in the Fed, and to be fair to them, the economists on Wall Street and in academia were that I had taken some kind of aggressive crackpot view. And there were some people like Rick, like Olivier Blanchard, who I think it's probably fair to say in somewhat less stark language in at least some of the cases, <laughs> um, shared my view. But it was very much a minority view. And I have spent a lot of time trying to think about why everybody else didn't see what I said, since it wasn't like I just went through some complicated, deep, detailed econometric analysis. And I think there are a combination of things. The first is the tyranny of limited statistics. People fit econometric models, and they tend to fit them to 40 years of data. And there's a basic truth, which is if you study statistically the properties of a constant, you will conclude that nothing changes the constant very much. And that will be what you'll conclude. And inflation had basically been constant for 40 years, so you weren't going to conclude that anything had a big multiplier to change uh, inflation. I think that was the first mistake. I think the second mistake was the general desire to make new mistakes. And that's just a feature of commentators. And the people, you know, the problem for the previous N years had been that inflation was too low. The problem the, for the end years was all the people who said there was going to be an inflation breakout had turned out to be wrong. And so nobody kind of wanted to make the same old mistake again. And, you know, frankly, I, it's not like I didn't understand that psychology, but I had actually thought on all the previous occasions that the concerns about, economic, about inflation were kind of silly. I had been on the side of believing in secular stagnation and deflation. So I thought, gosh, Larry, you don't, your mind doesn't work towards paranoia about inflation. And so if it seems obvious to you that there's going to be inflation, there's a pretty substantial chance you're right. So I think that was a second element. I think there was a third element, which is a really dangerous thing. And it's the thing that I've always prided myself on working very, very hard to avoid, and gets me in trouble quite frequently, which is avoiding motivated belief. And there were lots of people who wanted to believe that we could fight poverty really hard, vastly invest in public uh, in, uh, investment, help the states, 
make transfers to the middle class and that we could do all of these things and that it would end up helping the economy and being good. And they really wanted to believe that. And there were some say, arguments you could make in that direction, so they seized on them. And I think one of the real lessons is you have to separate what you'd like to be true um, from what actually is uh, true. And most of most great mistakes, you know, whether it's the Afghanistan war or the Vietnam war, all kinds of Iraq war, all kinds of mistakes start from believing what you hope will be true or what will generate the best consensus if it were true, rather than forming the best impressions you can from the data. So that's kind of how I got there. And that's kind of why I think uh, not everybody was there. And then there was one other thing that wasn't important at the beginning, but that I think was quite important by the time you got to the early, late summer or early fall. And uh, that is um, the inertia, what I call the inertia mentality. If you trade financial securities for a living, a basic thing you probably have deeply understood if you've managed to keep doing it for a large number of years is don't marry your position. If you own a set of securities, wake up every morning and ask yourself, would I buy these securities today if I didn't already own them? And if the answer is no, it's a little more complicated because of transactions costs, but roughly speaking, if I wouldn't buy them today, then I should sell them. And that's a kind of mentality where you're always open to changing your mind. The mentality of a public official or the mentality of an eminence generally is kind of exactly the opposite. It's, I've been saying this for the last two months. A lot of people have heard me say it. Should I say I was wrong or that I'm no longer right? Or should I continue to say what I've been saying? And the basic answer is, unless I have a compelling reason to decide I've been wrong, I might as well come on the horse that brought me and continue to say the thing. And so the Fed got itself in a position where it had kind of said transitory. Transitory was kind of looking goofy, but it wasn't conclusively proven, at least in their minds, to be false. So, and they'd look kind of bad having said transitory if they repudiated transitory. So, you know, when reduced to the absurd, defend the absurd. And that's kind of what they did. And they doubled down on it for a long time. And, you know, eventually it became completely untenable. And uh, then they flipped. But I think that's another thing that is useful in um, policy making is to have a bit of that traitor mentality. If I hadn't come to the party, come to this party, would I choose to go to this party uh, right now? And that's a, a useful discipline that I think was rather lacking. So I would add something to this that you actually mentioned, which is being a good economist and thinking economically. So Larry has done a lot more than I have, but we've both done a lot of consulting for, uh, for financial firms. Uh, and uh, just sometimes thinking about the basic economics is very powerful. So I want to make a pitch for that because I believe it so strongly. Uh, and I think there's several elements here, uh, which is in terms of what he's just said, which is, uh, one is the first of all, uh, understanding that uh, just looking at statistics can lead you very wrong. You gotta think about the economics behind it. So uh, uh, one of the issues, and I uh, uh, wonder if you agree with this, is I think there was a view, uh, uh, both in the profession and also at the Federal Reserve, that the Phillips curve was very flat. 
that basically that it didn't matter what the unemployment rate was, it wasn't going to produce inflation. And it's exactly for some of the reasons that Larry uh, mentioned. Uh, however, uh, if you actually think more deeply about the statistical relationship, uh, you'd understand that actually when the central bank is doing its job, which is to get ahead of inflation and be preemptive, then in fact uh, you're going to find a flat Phillips curve. If they stop doing that, then they're going to get in trouble. So one of the things I'd add also to the Fed's problems was the, the policy framework where they actually abandoned a lot of the good stuff that, that they had been doing for many years. Uh, that uh, uh, when I was there pushing things like inflation targeting, being preemptive and so forth, and they basically uh, dropped the ball on that. So I think that, that uh, 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 being a good economist matters a lot. I think also the issue of the Fed kept on talking about transitory, but as Larry mentioned, uh, there was a huge demand shock as well as a supply shock, both from the actual fiscal expansion and also from the issue of, of, uh, of the fact that there was pent-up demand. So we knew it. I, you know, I'm a foodie. We, we, I think Larry is too, maybe, maybe a little more than me. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> sorry about that, Larry. But uh, actually, Larry looks really good. He has lost weight. He's looking pretty good. So anyway, but I had to tease him. We couldn't help it. Just couldn't resist. Uh, and uh, we knew we couldn't spend any money. And that, that, uh, and actually, people's balance sheets were very strong. So, so I think that one of the things that Larry's saying that's very important is that, uh, um, and this is frequently done in the markets where you look at extrapolations and you don't think about the logic behind of what's going on. And if you do, you actually uh, can, can come to conclusions uh, that are uh, both actually very useful and sometimes uh, go against the grain. And also to Larry's credit, he was somebody who was considered a dovish person before this. Uh, and, and actually I was considered a dovish person, certainly by the Wall Street Journal. Uh, that if you use economics, you actually will realize that sometimes you have to change your mind. And uh, so that's a pitch for economics. And I'd say support the economics department, not just Sloan, if you can, because we're both uh, uh, from the economics department. So let me ask uh, the question about where the Fed is, uh, 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 what the Fed has been doing lately. Uh, uh, do you prove what the Fed has been doing lately? And very related to that is this issue that people have been talking about, uh, uh, the pivot. And you know that, that uh, you just made a speech on that and, and uh, actually mentioned, mentioned uh, something that I had written. But I think people would be very interested to, for you to, 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 to opine on what you think the Fed should do. What are they doing? Are they doing it right? Uh, uh, and what should they be doing in the future? So just on your, just on your point, Rick, um, the worst way for anybody to get along with me in some economic professional setting is to tell me something, and then when I ask them, why do you believe that, tell me that that's what the model says. <laughs> and you basically kind of, well, okay, but what's driving the model? And if you go, well, I don't know if that's what the model says, then you get thrown out of my office. So it's just a bad idea ever to believe something because it came out of a computer right. and a model if you can't explain it. So, you know, flat Phillips curve. Well, you know, it didn't take that, it wasn't that hard. You looked, we, the Vietnam War wasn't exactly ancient history. And in between 1966 and 1969, the inflation rate went from having a one handle to having a six handle. And the guns and butter collision of Lyndon Johnson was sure a lot smaller than 15% of GDP. So some idea that it couldn't happen because the Phillips curve was flat sort of had to be wrong. And that's not, not that hard to figure out. Yeah. But that is um, economics. He, he's right about the models. And I think the distinction is important. That uh, what he's criticizing in terms of models is that uh, you basically set up a very simple construct and you don't think very deeply about it. And then you have very strong conclusions from it. One of the things about being a good economist, uh, and particularly a policy economist, is to actually think about basic principles. And, uh, and that gets you to the right answer in this case, that's what Larry did. Any estimate that's, any calculation that's useful, the basic spirit and thrust of the calculation can be captured on the back of an envelope. Might take a pretty big envelope, <laughs> but if you, can't get, if you can't have a few magnitudes in your head that feel reasonable and combine them in the back of the envelope to reach your conclusion, you probably shouldn't put very much weight on uh, your conclusion. What about the Fed uh, today? Look, I think they're broadly in 
a much more appropriate place than that. If you ask the markets based on options what the probability is that the one-year rate would be in the range of 4.5 today, the answer that the options market would have given a year ago is about 3 in 1,000. It was so far out of the money that there weren't actually traded options that you sort of have to make an inference from where the 380 option was because that was kind of the highest one you could actually trade, and it was below 1%. So two or three-tenths of a percent is probably a good estimate. So we had a kind of shocking thing. I'd be very surprised if we had another equally shocking thing going forward. I think the Fed has decided that um, we are in an, infl- in an economy it currently has substantial inflation, that that economy will not be an economy that will turn itself back into being a low inflation economy without a substantial application of restrictive policy. And the Fed has said that it is going to apply restrictive policy as necessary to bring down the inflation rate to 2%. And I think that is the right thing for them uh, to be saying. If I told you, you know, you don't know, none of you know me very well, but you kind of have a bit of a sense of who I am and all that. If I told you that I was going to buy a 2,000 square foot apartment in a nice neighborhood in New York because I wanted to spend time in New York, you'd probably say, okay, the guy probably will do that, the guy probably can afford to do that, all that. If I told you that I was going to spend $500,000 for the apartment, and I was going to get a nice 2,000-square-foot apartment in a nice part of New York, you would decide I wasn't nearly as smart as you thought I was before, <laughs> and you would decide who knew whether I was really going to do it or not, because I was going to look around and I was going to discover what that apartment cost, and then maybe I would be willing to pay what it actually cost, and maybe I wouldn't. In the same way, when the Fed says it's absolutely determined to bring down inflation to 2%, and it believes it will be able to do that with (laughs) unemployment peaking at 4.4%, what are you they smoking? What are they smoking? What are, you know, you, you, don't <laughs> think, you don't think they're making much sense. And when they learn what the real price is, you don't really know whether they'll be prepared to pay the real price or not. And that's the big problem with uh, where, they, where they are uh, right now. Now, I, my best guess is that I don't think the current market estimate of the terminal rate, which is about 510. I don't think that's a crazy estimate. My best guess is that if you want to bring uh, inflation down substantially, let alone to two, it's probably going to have to be meaningfully above that, closer to six than to five. But I'm not certain of that, and I don't think there's a need to rush to a judgment about that. So I think the Fed is not in an unreasonable place right now. I do think they're in a somewhat unreasonable place on how cheap uh, it is to achieve disinflation. My best guess is that at some level they know that, and it's just painful to be predicting a recession. And so they're kind of easing in to... uh, the bad, uh, the bad news would be my best would be my best guess. But look, it's very hard to know what will happen. There's very high volatility in markets. There could be all kinds of financial accidents. So I mean, it's not inconceivable. It's not by not inconceivable that inflation will come down faster than I think. I think if it does, it will probably manifest itself in a significantly more serious recession than the unemployment rate going up uh, to uh, 4.4%. But 
you know, you can hide a lot of sins around the concept of the mode. That is, when my method of making forecasts, whenever I make a forecast of anything, you know, what time will I be home for dinner, dear? Whatever it is, if I make a forecast, what I always say to myself is, my forecasting isn't very good. I'm not gonna, I'm probably not gonna get this right. So I push it way up and I push it way down and I see whether those numbers are equally plausible. And if they're not, then I conclude I don't have a very realistic forecast. And if you do that, you, I think, improve your forecast. You, if you do that, you never say something that is frequently said by economic forecasters, which is, my forecast is X, but the risks are disproportionately to the downside. My reaction is, well, if risks are disproportionately to the downside, then you should probably lower your forecast. <laughs> it's, the, it's the essence of a proper forecast that the risks are kind of equally proportionally to the downside and the upside. Now, the slight salvation is to say, my forecast is of the mode of my distribution, mm -hmm. and my distribution is asymmetric, and so it kind of can make sense if you think that, but I don't think most of the people who do this are they're just kind of not thinking very carefully, not with a deep and elaborate theory about modes, medians, and, um, and means. So, you know, when I look at the world today and I see, the, I see people forecasting 4.4% unemployment as the peak, and then I see them forecasting uh, inflation for the next five years at 2.7% on the CPI, which means 2.3% on the uh, consumption deflator that the Fed uses, I kind of go, okay. We know we're no good at forecasting this. Can I imagine a plausible scenario where unemployment gets to six? Yeah, pretty easily, I can imagine that. Can I imagine an unemployment, uh, a pretty plausible scenario where unemployment gets below three? Pretty hard to do. So I guess 4.4 is not a very good estimate. Similarly, can I imagine a plausible scenario where Inflation is not 2.7, but 4.7. Yeah, in a world where who the hell knows what's going to happen to the oil market, where who the hell knows what's going to happen to wages, where it's been running above 7. Can I imagine that inflation will end up at 4.7? Pretty easily. Can I imagine that inflation will end up at 0.7? I can imagine it if you had a bad enough depression, but <laughs> the 2008 financial crisis was really, was really pretty terrible, and it didn't bring inflation down to 0.7, so seems kind of unlikely. So like, why are markets saying the inflation rate's going to be 2.7? Kind of a mystery. So I think that's just a kind of useful discipline to bring to the process of uh, forecasting. That's great. Uh, just before we go to, to open Q&A, uh, let's talk a little bit about fiscal policy. So uh, uh, you were very critical of the, uh, the uh, $1.9 trillion uh, bill. Uh, uh, then there was a, a trillion dollar uh, uh, infrastructure package. Uh, and then recently uh, there was this uh, forgiveness of student debt, which we don't know will go through legally or not, but but uh, was, has been uh, uh, implemented as an executive order. So uh, what do you think about fiscal policy uh, uh, under the Biden administration? Uh, and you were always known as somebody who was actually uh, pretty pro-spending. Of course, you wanted to do it on infrastructure projects. So uh, where do you sort of come at as to where fiscal policy should be? And maybe related to that is uh, what's going to happen to the to, to the, the Democrats as a result of all of this uh, expansionary fiscal policy in the, in the midterm election and possibly afterwards? <laughs> so look, um, I'm supposed to make it fun. Come on, right? Well, at least you're off the subject of my weight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we're going to do a stand-up routine at uh, one of the comedy clubs shortly after this. If you were advising one of your children about borrowing money, you would kind of say, 
it's a good idea to borrow your mo- borrow money to buy a house because if you buy a house, you're going to have the house forever, and that you're not going to have to pay rent in the future. And if the interest rate's low and the rental price ratio is high, you're going to save money, and so it's like good economics to borrow money. But if you're borrowing money because you wish you had more money and your income's not particularly going to go up in the future, but you just want to spend more, so you're like running your credit card up real high, then you're probably making a mistake. And all of us could give advice to our children or to ourselves about borrowing money. And that's kind of the right way for the government to think about it, too. If you're borrowing to invest, that's a good idea. If you're borrowing because your income is transitorily low or your needs are transitorily high, that's probably a good reason to borrow. If you're just kind of borrowing because you want to borrow, well, then unless you're really struck that it's like really an advantageous moment to borrow, in which case you should make sure you're borrowing long and borrowing in a long-term way, then it's probably much more problematic to borrow. So I kind of think we borrowed much too much money to not invest and to give a lot of transfer payments that were going to be temporary with the Rescue Act. I thought that was a pretty bad idea. I thought borrowing money in order to uh, invest in infrastructure was a pretty good idea, especially since at the time interest rates were extremely low. I think the Fed has done something for the last nine months of which were a substantial blunder, which was quantitative, which was the continuation of quantitative easing. Something nobody says in the discussions of quantitative easing is that quantitative easing is terming in your debt. What the Fed does when it does quantitative easing is it creates money that's like basically reserves that pay interest at the prevailing interest rate in order to buy long-term bonds. So in effect, the United States taxpayer, who used to have long-term debt outstanding, now has floating rate short-term debt outstanding. Well, at a moment when every corporation in America was deciding to term out its debt, when every homeowner was trying to get a long-term mortgage rather than a floating rate mortgage, there is a question why these jokers decided on behalf of the taxpayers of the United States that we needed to term in the debt and replace it with short debt rather than long debt. Now, if that was a necessary thing to do to make the treasury market function, then it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do, and that was true in the immediate aftermath of 2008. That was true in the immediate beginning of the, of the pandemic. By no conceivable stretch of the imagination was it true in the summer of 2021. The only thing that was more ludicrous than buying the Treasury debt was in the midst of a housing run-up in prices that was bigger than the housing run-up in prices we'd had before the financial crisis was to be buying up mortgages <laughs> like a banshee to drive down the mortgage rate further and stimulate the housing sector. So that didn't really make much sense at all. So the right principle is sometimes borrow long in order to invest. And I wouldn't say we've been, between the Fed and the Treasury, I wouldn't say we've done a spectacular job of figuring that out and getting it right. I don't hear the music on the student, le- student loan relief. It seems to me that, roughly speaking, half of America gets to try college or go to college and half of America doesn't. That why you would want to have a program that gives money to the people in the fortunate half of the population who decided not to save for their college educations, decided to invest in more expensive rather than less expensive uh, educations that's financed by everybody, it's just kind of hard to understand why that's a particularly appealing uh, 
thing uh, to do. Now, there's an argument which is that, and and by this by this summer, saying that we were doing this because we'd had some kind of pandemic emergency, which is the legal justification. When like wealth was at a record high, when there was more money sitting in checking accounts than ever before, when credit defaults on car loans and everything else was at an epic low, saying that this was some kind of rational response to pandemic emergency, I found very, very hard to justify. So the argument for it was, look, um, we do a lot of things in the country for people who are poor. Do less for people who are middle class. The there's a lot of basically false advertising, false selling of higher education. The government hasn't done such a great job of cleaning it up. People don't trust the government to run programs. They should, maybe, maybe they shouldn't, but in any event, they don't. And so uh, what they do kind of trust the government to do is if the government says you don't have to pay your debt, then you don't. And so a government that was trying to get back the confidence of middle class citizens decided that as one among many measures, that was what they were going to do. I wouldn't have done it if it had been my choice, because um, I think the first set of arguments is more compelling than the second set of arguments. But the second set of arguments, you can see, I mean, one of the things, one of the things that I think is very important that I always tell people in watching the government, and I actually think the same thing is usually probably true in watching companies. If people are doing something that seems crazy to you, it's probably not because they're stupid and they didn't think of what you thought of. It's probably because they feel a certain set of pressures that they feel more strongly than you think they should, or maybe than they actually should, and they're acting on those pressures. And so the Biden administration didn't do this because it hadn't occurred to them that college graduates were rich. College people were richer than poorer people, I promise. They were well aware of that. They didn't do it because it hadn't occurred to them that if you relieve debt, people would spend more money and that that might nudge the price up. They did it because showing that the government can deliver for middle-class people who are swing-type voters was something that was really important to them in terms of their broad purposes and because they wanted to recognize and acknowledge what was a real problem around all the people who kind of started college, borrowed money, and hadn't ended up with uh, degrees. So I think the lesson I want to leave, we, leave you with about this is when you disagree with people, don't assume that it's just that they don't understand at all. And if you ever have a chance to talk to a public official, the it's it is very, very rare with public officials, it's very, very rare that if you say something and they don't agree, that repeating it louder will cause them to change their mind. <laughs> and it is amazing to me in a life that has had a fair amount of being in leadership positions of one kind or other in Washington or at Harvard, how many people's response to my saying, I don't think I agree with that, is to repeat it. And I can tell you that it, roughly speaking, never works. <laughs> a much better strategy is to try to understand it from the perspective of the person you're interacting with, who may be making a bad decision. It's not that all decisions are, it's not that all decisions are good, but you really have to try to understand why people are making the decisions that they are if you want to be usefully engaged in the dialogue. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Larry. Let's open the floor to questions. And if you want to ask a question, you, you got to actually walk to, uh, to the microphone. So you can just line up there.
Is it on? Just is it on? Yeah, yeah. it is. Oh, hi, Larry. Uh, Fred, thanks so much for the um, for the fireside chat. Quick question: um, There's been commentary that um, secular interest rates that they've been trending down for the last thirty years, and that era is now over. Do you have a view on that? That you know we're going into a new era structurally where interest rates will drift higher. Forty sixty. I think the um, I think there are two arguments. One argument is, look, we'll get through this inflation, we'll get through this moment, and it'll be back like it was before the pandemic. And for reasons of demography, for reasons involving the price of capital goods, for reasons of uncertainty, for all kinds of reasons, there was a 30-year trend to lower interest rates. <coughs> that trend will continue and we'll be back where we are. We're back where we were, that's one argument. Second argument is, no, no, you don't understand. We've now got vastly more government debt than we did. And every 1% of GDP in government debt pushes interest rates up by two or three basis points. We've got larger deficits going forward than we did. We're going to make massive investments in energy transformation. And we've decided we want to be a resilient society, so we're going to build two of everything. And that's going to mean more capital investment demand. And those, those things together are going to change the other trends and the neutral interest rate is going to be much higher. Those are basically the those are basically the two sets of considerations. And anybody who tells you they know which one is right, you should disbelieve. My bet my best guess, having thought about it a fair amount, is probably 60-40. We're not going to be in an era of super low real interest rates uh, going uh, going forward, and that we probably need to adjust to that. But it's kind of a 60-40 thing. Next question. Professor Summers, I'd like to summon your powers of arithmetic here with this question. Interest rates on the present government debt, about $31 trillion, obviously they're going up. So we're going to pay more dollars out in interest. How do we pay for it? Look. Um, in the 1960s, we were a country that could afford to spend 9% on our national defense. Today, we're a country that spends about 3.5% of GDP on defense and is probably going to decide to spend 4.5% because of all the new threats. But we managed to spend 9% of our GDP on defense, and nobody thought the country was going to go bankrupt in the 1960s or 1960s. So an extra 1% interest is about 1% of GDP, looking out several years. And if we have to spend 1% more interest, you know, spend more percent uh, more interest, I don't think the government's going to go bank. I don't think the government's going to go bankrupt because of that. And in addition, it makes a big difference whether the higher interest rates reflect the fact that you're paying back the debt in cheaper dollars, and so you're having inflation. One thing to be one thing to have a mortgage with inflation at 6% when your house is going up at 4% a year than it is to have a mortgage at 6% when your house is going up at 1% a year. So it's sort of the real interest rate that matters. And the real interest rate is probably only part of what is uh, going up. So I think one can overdo uh, the panic. That All of that having been said, I think that one of the things that will happen in the national financial debate over the next six months is that there will be a growing awareness that the higher interest rates that you talked about, plus the fact that recessions mean that the debt will grow faster, plus the fact that you can't look at the geopolitics and not think that whatever your defense projection was a few years ago isn't going to be higher. Plus the fact that there's a whole range of contingencies and various gimmicks of one kind or other that are not fully reflected in the existing projections. You're going to start seeing a set of medium-term deficit projections that are going to start looking quite scary. I thought in 2011, I had the then 
unconventional and heretical, but I would argue ex post correct view, that the whole Simpson Bowles hysteria was kind of unnecessary because I thought we had extraordinarily low real interest rates, that we had an economy that needed stimulus, that if we started doing a whole bunch of fiscal contraction, then we'd need to have negative interest rates in order to keep the economy going, but we couldn't have negative interest rates, so we'd mostly produce a recession. So I thought then that the whole Simpsons Bowles excitement about the deficit was misguided. That's not what I think today, because I think where the deficit projections are going to get will have a good chance of looking really uh, quite ominous uh, going uh, forward. Separately, it's not the question uh, you asked, but your question's a springboard for me to remark that one of the least edifying spectacles in American public life that we're about to go through is a debt limit crisis. <laughs> in addition to committing to borrow money, when the government, Congress sets a debt limit, and then periodically it has to raise the debt limit or the government can't borrow any more money, and that's going to come sometime in the next few months, and they're going to be, and everybody tries to have it you know, brinkmanship and games of chicken and all that over that. And my guess is that in the current hostile, polarized uh, environment, that's going to be a pretty ugly uh, process. I am highly confident that at the end of the day, the United States will not have destroyed its credit, but enormous amounts of mental energy will go into that fairly stupid game of chicken that could be going into <coughs> thinking about what's probably the most important thing that was actually in the news today, which is that the average American kid is um, kind of two-thirds of a year behind where they normally would have been because of whatever is or is not going, in, going on in our schools. And, you know, if you calculate the value of the country's human capital and you kind of think about what one year less of effective schooling for 30 million kids who are in school is, you're talking about a number in the trillions. And, you know, I don't know whether the right answer is um, higher, pay, higher pay for teachers like Democrats tend to think or more charter, more charter schools and more ability to fire teachers like Republicans think. My guess is it's got elements of both, but that would seem to me to be a more productive debate for the country to have than the debate we're going to have about some bunch of brinkmanship on uh, the debt limit. Next hi, question. Hi, Larry. I wanted to ask you about the international aspects. There are many other countries that probably haven't put the foot to the, the accelerator like the U.S., uh, and haven't, you know, this, this gap of 12% or whatever you're talking about. Uh, how, how are those countries faring? Uh, is there anything that we can learn from, from that? Uh, it's a big, complicated, it's a big, complicated world. I would say that the UK is broadly kind of like us. Um, Europe is, Japan has been kind of trying to borrow and all that for a long time, but they've got a population that's shrinking so fast that it's just really hard to get momentum going in their economy. And we'll see what we'll see how all of that uh, plays uh, plays out. They're committed to they're right now saying two things that are pretty contradictory. They're saying that they're gonna have hyper low interest rates and they're gonna set hyper-low interest rates for a really long time, and they're saying they want their currency to go up in value because it's gotten too low. And those things are in some tension with each other because hyper-low hyper interest rate currencies tend to get borrowed rather than have their bonds uh, get bought, and that tends to lead the currencies to fall further. So I think Japan's in a complicated situation. There's a talking point, there's a thing that people in the administration say, and some people in the 
progressive community say, which is, you're all wrong, Larry. Uh, we've got high inflation, but Europe's got high inflation too. And they didn't have big stimulus like we did. And so it must not have to do with the big stimulus. That's the thing people say a lot. Well, it's true that they do have high inflation, but they have had natural gas prices go up by a factor of 10. And the fact that they've had natural gas and electricity prices go up by a factor of 10, and they have only about the same inflation we do, and that they've got much slower wage growth, they've got much higher unemployment, I think doesn't really call into question at all my interpretation of uh, what's caused U.S. inflation. Thanks. Hi, Larry. Uh, Alfred Spector. Uh, I was wondering if we could like expand the universe a little bit and talk about some things that are really happening towards the future, even, even more than interest rates and economic policy. I was thinking about China, because that's been in the news a lot with the party congress and such. Uh, you, you were always a proponent of kind of free trade and the traditional ways with, with China and such. Um, what should we be doing now in this world uh, where geopolitics is uh, much more complex? We should be thinking very, very carefully. And I don't think there's any simple uh, answer. I think it's pretty clear that whether or not it was reasonable to believe in the 1990s that a strategy of engaging heavily with China, trading heavily with China, welcoming China into international institutions would set off a process of convergence where they would follow a path like uh, Korea or Taiwan um, to become a society like ours. Whatever, that may well have been, a re that may or may not have been a reasonable bet when it was being made in the 1990s. But it does not look like that is a reasonable assessment of the situation in uh, the tyrannical world of Xi Jinping. And so the question is, what is your alternative uh, strategy? I fear that we are lurching from a strategy of engagement to a strategy of suppression. Quite stunning thing happened a couple of weeks ago. We announced export controls on China. And our export controls on semiconductors, not an announcement that, like the old announcements we used to make with respect to Russia, that there were sensitive military technologies that we did not want to get into other people's hands. It was an announcement that was more like international leadership in the global economy is at stake. Intellectual property is important. We want to be absolutely as far ahead of them as we possibly can be. And therefore, there can't be interchange between our countries because we like it better if they're poorer and we're further ahead. Well, if you were them, you wouldn't like that very much. And you would do everything you could to reduce your dependence on us. And by the way, once they're independent, we can't threaten. We lose our leverage once they're completely uh, separate. Our firms, our semicon semiconductors, big area with a lot of economies of scale, if you cut off the opportunity to sell to a third of their market, those firms are not going to have nearly as good economics around uh, innovation as they did before. China's going to have a tough time economically for all kinds of reasons going forward. Do we want to maximize the ability to make ourselves the scapegoat? I'm not at all sure that we do. I think what we need to be doing is crafting a policy that is somewhere between engagement and uh, suppression that is firm 
without being actively uh, hostile. And it's much easier to say those kinds of cliches than it is to frame it. That policy uh, issue uh, by issue. But I think that's the general uh, nature of uh, where we want uh, where we want to go. Okay. Well, you know, all of us with our portfolios don't claim to know what the future is going to be uh, exactly. And when you were talking about the government, neither do they. And so we have some economic maneuvers that, that can help uh, keep us on a more steady path than, than uh, high and low. And we got the fiscal, but that's up to um, uh, what, part, what, what parties may be in, in control, but how the people vote. So I don't know that we can think of anything there because that's part of our basic form of government. But with the Fed, is there any practical, philosophical, reasonable way to think of why would they want to keep interest rates low forever? Why don't they have to change their interest rates? I mean, not eight or nine years. It's never going to be 0% almost like it was for so long with any uh, probability. Why not you know, say, look, it's time to ratchet up a little bit. And maybe even now taking a pause in the increase of uh, the interest rates. Well, I'm not sure, what you're, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. They, they have been raising interest rates because they recognize yeah. that they were too low. I think that if you say they should pause, you have to decide what you mean by that. Do you mean that part of their policy has been creating an expectation that interest rates are on a path from zero to five and that we're at three now. And does a pause mean that that's the policy we're going to execute and then we're going to stop having policies, one definition of a pause? Or does a pause mean we're going to stop at three and give everybody a big pleasant surprise and send the market up 5,000 points <laughs> at the risk of setting off some substantial amount of inflation. So even the idea of having a pause requires some definition. As I think I said, my view is that I think it would be a clear mistake not to follow through on the signals they've sent pointing towards interest rates rising towards uh, five. That I don't think there's a need to send strong committal signals with respect to interest rates above five uh, right now. That my best guess is that when the time comes, given how inflation will evolve, that will be the decision uh, that they make. But one of the things that you need to learn as any kind of public official, and that I think in particular the Fed has really badly lost sight of is that Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan understood what the Delphi Oracles understood, which is that if everybody thinks you're omniscient and omnipotent, but actually you're just kind of a person finding your way in an uncertain world, you should probably not make too many pronouncements. And the ones you make should be kind of vague and oracular <laughs> rather than quantitative and specific so that you can preserve the illusion of your omniscience and your omnipotence. Not because it's so good for you, but because everybody out there feels more comfortable like there's someone who's uh, in uh, someone who's in control. But, you know, all things considered. I believe in transparency. I really, I do believe in transparency, but I think it's just as well that when I'm flying United Airlines, I'm not listening to everything the pilot says to the co-pilot at every moment when there's some possible turbulence, because I think it would mostly serve to kind of make me uneasy and just wouldn't be better. And I think that the Fed has fetishized, under the influence of academics, I might say, has fetishize transparency to 
massive excess. You know, to give one example, I mean, to give two examples, actually. Uh, one is, like, why do we need to know what all 19 people think the interest rate's going to be in 2025 and the unemployment rate's going to be in 2025 when the people don't have a clue and when the people, if, insofar as they do have a clue, can't say what they really think because it might be upsetting to people about the possibility of a recession. Like, why do we have that institution? Why is it that the President's National Security Council can deliberate about wars without having to publish its deliberations two weeks later? <clears throat> but somehow we think the Federal Reserve has to publish its deliberations two weeks later, so that means none of the deliberations take place in the meetings. They take place before the meetings, which is a lot less efficient and <laughs> doesn't work as well. Why do we need to have a specific numerical target for what we're trying to achieve with inflation? Alan Greenspan had it right in the late 1990s when he said, our goal is price stability. Price stability is when people aren't thinking about rising prices. Period. <laughs> Why do we need to have, so now we've got this problem. This really is a problem. Um, I mean, we, we've got this 2% target. So every week, Jay Powell has to say, I'm absolutely committed to the 2% target. So he doubles down on the 2% target because if a week went by when he didn't say he was absolutely committed to the 2% target, everybody would get go hysterical because he wasn't committed to the 2% target anymore. But, you know, who the hell knows where we're going to be and when inflation comes, to, comes down to 3 and the unemployment rate is 6%, is it really going to be the right thing to do to send unemployment to 7 in order to get... Um, the inflation down the threat down from three to two. Maybe it is if it's important to be credible and you've made all kinds of promises. But most of us learn in raising our children that the words we'll see are a really important thing to say. And that if you answer every question with an answer, then you're going to have to have your answers not come true and they're going to be upset and blah, blah, blah. And it's just better to not be absolutely committal. And, you know, I think that's the kind of the Fed's, that's kind of a really important aspect of uh, central bank uh, communication. Let me just conclude by saying that um, as an MIT alum and as a former uh, university administrator, albeit not at MIT, that you all, by being part of gatherings uh, like this, are doing a really important thing, and uh, that it does make a difference to what goes on on uh, campuses, and is an important uh, source of uh, support. And that I am really glad as an MIT alum, I don't know whether I've paid it forward or I've paid it backwards exactly, but I was honored to get this invitation. And I'm really glad to have been here. And on the off chance that any of you don't like MIT, there are lots of things we can involve you in at Harvard. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Well, we promised you candid, but you also got humor. So thank you very, very much. And everyone, please give the professors Michigan and Summers a warm round of applause. And a small token of our appreciation, Professor Michigan. It is heavy. <laughs> but it's not ticket. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Thank you. And thank you, audience. <laughs> <laughs>